and start sharing my screen and take you through some housekeeping just briefly. So can I, can I just check you can see the slide there saying Creative Spark? Yeah, super, okay. So this is um, webinar number four, and um, we're halfway through uh, of a series of webinars um, as part of a Creative Spark project that we've been involved with for a number of years um, with the British Council. And this week we are going to hear from Dr. Matthew Gorton and Dr. Ian Merrill on the setting up and managing of rural enterprise hubs, clusters, co-working, and looking at the, the case of the National Innovation Centre for Rural Enterprise. So um, I'm sure you've all heard this before, but just very briefly, Creative Spark is um, an initiative run by the British Council. It operates in seven countries um, and including Azerbaijan. Uh, it, this is number four, we're halfway through, um, we're recording the session. Um, just a little reminder, if you're not um, speaking or asking a question, if you could mute, mute your microphone, we'll have questions and answers after the presentation. Um, and if you wouldn't mind completing the feedback uh, survey after the webinar, we would very much appreciate it. So um, just to give a brief introduction to our speakers today, um, Dr. Matthew Gorton is a professor of marketing at Newcastle University, um, deputy director of the National Innovation Centre for Rural Enterprise um, and coordinates the EU Horizon 2020 project. Um, Dr. Ian Merrill, um, joined um, NICRE as a ESRC postdoc uh, research fellow and um, completed his BSc, MSc and PhD at the Centre for Rural Economy at Newcastle University. Um, so I think um, without further ado, I will hand over to the speakers today. So I will stop sharing and allow um, our speakers to take it from here. So they'll talk for about um, half an hour or so, and then we'll have questions and we will finish at 11 o'clock. Okay, so I will stop sharing and hand over to Matthew and Ian. Thank you. So it's nice to be with everyone today. In this seminar, I'm going to give a little bit of a brief overview to what NICER is about. So that's the National Innovation Centre for Rural Enterprise. And then Ian is going to discuss in more detail a particular strand of work which is being uh, taking place within NICER that related to enterprise hubs. So I'll say a little bit about what NICER is about, its objectives, uh, who's involved and how we could potentially link with Azerbaijan before handing over to Ian. So, what NICE is about is really three main objectives. So the first objective is to try and understand what's going on on the ground in terms of rural innovation and rural enterprise. So what's the degree of productivity and the resilience of rural businesses? Um, what factors are leading to greater innovation and better enterprise performance? more resilient uh, communities and economies within rural areas. So it's very much about establishing a core evidence base, which is built on research. The second strand is looking to develop with non-academic partners some demonstration projects. So it's looking at some of the grand challenges which are faced by economies around the world, such as aging society, issues to do with mobility and decarbonisation, about digitalization of the economy and what does that mean for future uh, patterns of employment and work and communities. And thinking about how we can institute some sample projects, pilot projects on the ground, working with non-academic partners to think about how to deal with those challenges uh, in a way in which would also allow for scope if they're successful to be upscaled. So they are, they're pilots, they're initiatives, some will work extremely well and others may not work, but we'll learn the lessons from that. And on the call is uh, Paul Cowie and Barbara who are both involved in, and leading work in that second strand. And then the third strand is 
to link what we're doing regarding research and the innovation projects with policy and support services. So it's to make sure that what we're doing isn't lost, that there's impact there, that it leads to better policy and also better business support. And Melanie, who's also on this call, is heavily involved in that strand of work. So Ian, if we move on to the next slide. So NISA started operations last September. So we've been going about uh, three quarters of a year and it's led by Jeremy Phillipson, who is uh, based at Newcastle University. Uh, initial tranche of money is from Research England. So most of the work currently is focused on England or the UK, but we are looking to expand from that base. The core academic partners are from Newcastle University, so that includes Centre for Rural Economy, where Ian's based and did his PhD, but also the business school as well. So many of the people um, in Azerbaijan who've been working on the Creative Spark project will know um, colleagues who are also involved in NISA. Also includes the Enterprise Research Center from Warwick University, led by Steve Roper, and the Countryside and Community Research Institute, which is um, a collaboration between Gloucestershire and the Royal Agricultural Universities. Now, in addition to those academic partners, we have some non-academic partners who are also involved. So one of the leading chains of accountants within the UK, um, who are obviously dealing with businesses, rural and urban businesses uh, on a daily basis, and also Strutton Parker, which is one of the largest land management and estate management companies uh, who are based in the UK. So if we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the key questions which we're uh, working on at the moment. So these are the sorts of questions which we're trying to answer. So it's things about, well, how can rural enterprises, particularly uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, be best supported to innovate, to grow and export? What problems do rural enterprises face? So, for example, in terms of access to external finance or business support. And if those problems exist, how can they best be overcome? So what might be the mechanisms for having more effective engagement with rural enterprises? Then thinking about what's been the impact of COVID-19 on rural economies, how effective have pandemic support measures been, what's worked and what hasn't worked. And then also thinking about how rural enterprises can contribute to regional development. So a lot of regional development traditionally in the UK has been very cities based, but is that justified? What can rural areas do? Do they have particular strengths? Are the um, challenges or problems to do with energy and mobility and the environment where rural areas can make a significant contribution to. So if we move on to the next slide. The initial work of NISA has been very much focused on England and the UK because of the nature of our initial funding. But we very much hope to expand international coverage through projects. So the people involved in NISA, some are also involved in Creative Spa, or have been involved in other regional development projects uh, around Europe. So some of those are more research-based, connected with um, Horizon 2020 or other European funded projects, but also some of the more applied projects, for example, under Interreg. So the Integrow project has been looking at developing regional policies for innovation to support the competitiveness and growth of rural SMEs. And in that project, we're the sole academic partner and the other partners are managing authorities of regional development funds. And we've tried to look at what's been the lessons from how they've spent their funding, how they can make it more effective. And one of the things which has come out of the Integro project is a lot of interest in enterprise hubs as a way of supporting the growth and performance of rural SMEs. And that's something which Ian's become an expert on and has been working on. So he's going to give you a little bit of a flavor of that work in greater depth now. Um, so the final thing from me to say is that we'd be very happy to build our linkages with Azerbaijan. So we know that um, from our work with Azerbaijan, 
the country is looking to diversify its economy away from oil and gas that um, has significant rural territories. A lot of um, SMEs are interested in digital, are interested in food industry and competitiveness. And we'd be very um, open to discussions about how we can work with agents who are interested in that field, either through Creative Spark or other British Council or European initiatives. So uh, nice to meet you. And I'm going to pass over now to Ian to talk in greater depth about the hub's work. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thank you for inviting me today to present here. Um, as Matt said, um, I've got an involvement with NYSA. Um, I did my PhD on rural enterprise hubs, um, which Matt uh, was a supervisor of, and so was Paul Cowie, who was in the chat, who was also very knowledgeable about them, um, and Professor Jeremy Phillips as well. Um, so what are an rural enterprise hubs? Um, very simply put, they're physical infrastructures, uh, buildings which promote entrepreneurship. Um, I've put one example here on the right, which is um, quite a grand example. They're not all this big, um, but this one is one that's managed by the National Park in Northumberland. Um, quite a lot of this one goes underground as well, so you can't see it all from the picture. Um, but this one is kind of like a flagship model in the region, but they come in all different shapes and sizes um, from very small, which might hold three or four businesses, um, all the way up to something of this scale or something um, that's run by the public sector. The largest one in my study ho owned 42 businesses, I believe, so a, quite a big range. Um, what we're going to do today is talk through their role in regional development. Um, so there's two models of honeypot, um, sorry, of, of hubs, um, a honeypot and a hive. And this is terminology that Paul and colleagues um, created during their initial study of the hubs. Um, these two management strategies um, are either to foster business to client or business to business businesses. Um, so this is the idea that uh, honeypots have a particular public facing role. Um, so they want to attract people to the site, they want them to come in, they want them to look around and, and buy goods from, from the tenants or other or services, um, which this example on the right is one of those. Um, or you have a hive hub, um, which is intended to be more kind of an office based um, offer um, and that would be for businesses such as accountants or website designers, um, people that sell services to other businesses. And the idea here is to create a stimulating environment which encourages networking and collaborations to form. Um, so they're the two models. Uh, in the northeast of England, which is where my PhD was based, there was 38 of these at the time. Um, and these covered a range of different localities. So some of the hubs were quite close to our cities in the region. Uh, others were very, very remote. Um, 42 miles to the nearest city was the most remote one that I visited, um, which lies somewhere between Newcastle and, and Edinburgh. So really, really in the middle of nowhere. Um, they also have a range of ownerships as well. So we found Good examples of privately owned ones, uh, ones managed by the public sector, and then one managed by third sector charities or uh, community groups, development groups, things like this. Um, I think the takeaway message from that in particular is that there isn't one ownership model that's better than the others. Um, they serve different functions for different economies. Um, you know, the, the private sector one tended to be in more affluent economies closer to the city, uh, whereas the third sector ones tended to be the more remote ones, um, you know, where where no one else would go, really. And the, the third sector and the charities would come in and, and set them up there. And then the public sector ones tended to be around ex-industrial areas that needed kind of a, you know, spark to get them going again. Um, so that was a, a rough pattern. 
Um, and then also, as I've mentioned, they came in various different scales from, you know, very, very small to decent size, um, large scale. Um, I've also recently started to call them platforms um, in some of the research and papers that I've been writing. This is an idea that came from economic geography. Um, and a platform is basically something that um, you can launch things upwards from. So if there's a particularly innovative business that's in a hub, they have the support to then be projected into higher growth patterns, let's say. Um, but it's also a platform downwards as well in the sense that business support agencies and people who are delivering business support um, automatically have a group of businesses that they can go and see and deliver business support to. Um, which in rural areas is obviously quite a big thing because businesses are very spread out. Um, so if you're a business support agent, um, as Melanie, I'm sure, will know, you have to drive quite long distances um, only to go and meet you know, one person who might be operating in the middle of nowhere. So having a platform that they can go to and know that they can deliver to, let's say, 10 businesses with only one trip, um, reduce the cost, increases the efficiency of the business support. So apologies that there's quite a lot on this slide, but this is a breakdown of some of the services um, that are offered at the hubs. Um, so there's two columns, uh, one for Hive, which is the business to business, and one for the Honeypot, which is more for the uh, business to customer. So this would be uh, retail, art and craft, um, what else did we find good examples of? People doing like um, services as well, so like massage um, and things like this. Um, so the way that we split it up during my research was to discuss tangible facilities, let's call them. Um, so in here we have the workspaces, which is the obvious one, uh, furnishings, so desks, meeting rooms, which was very important as well. Uh, meeting rooms obviously are a a good service to offer because people can book them out. Hold me there, pretty straightforward. Um, shared office equipment. Um, you know, if you're just starting off as a business, then having to buy these expensive printers or photocopiers um, can all add up. So if, if businesses can share the cost of that um, or the, the hub itself buys them and then they use them, it saves them money. Um, broadband was a big, um, a big, driver let's say that if you don't have good broadband um then the businesses are less inclined to come um having a reception area was seen as quite a positive as well especially again if you're a small young business um you know you wouldn't necessarily want to hire a receptionist or do a lot of those tasks yourself because you want to be running your own business um so offering those services was seen as a positive um Having a communal kitchen as well uh, was seen as a, a massive benefit because that's where most people did informal networking um, over their lunch or over a tea or coffee. Um, during my PhD, I sat myself in these communal kitchens for many weeks and watched and observed people's conversations. Um, so I have a, a very good understanding of the kitchens of these places. Um, and then on the honeypot side of things, it, it was slightly different, um, you know, less emphasis on um, on meeting rooms and more uh, they, the tenants appreciated rooms to uh, host workshops and exhibitions and things like this. Um, but on the whole, quite similar um, as far as the facilities that were offered. Um, and then the, the intangible services are more things that aren't physical but still help businesses to improve. Um, for example, support agencies could hold residencies in there where they would have a small uh, room where the tenants could drop in and discuss various things such as grants or um, mentoring advice, things like this. Um, the hubs would also host their own training events as well. So there was quite a big drive in the hubs at the time of my research um, of the, of a government department going in and teaching people how to export goods. Um, so that could be, again, one of these platforms where 
government agencies or development agencies can go and, and deliver from. Um, networking events was also seen as um, a very good service to offer. That was, you know, to encourage people to, to get to know each other, to see how they could share business together. Um, and on, in a similar vein, social events helped um, raise a kind of cohesion in, in the enterprise hub. Um, and then we have various other things, um, which generally just made the business's life more easy to run and let them focus on actually operating the business rather than doing all of the other things around the sides of running a business, which often take more time than running the business itself. So um, all of these things help businesses to improve and to grow, uh, to focus more on their business. So what are the benefits um, for this? I uh, interviewed lots of tenants in the hubs um, and found out what the biggest benefits were for joining the hub. Um, it's important to say that all of this stuff is based around agglomeration theory, which is a concept from economic geography, um, which suggests that if you increase proximity between businesses, then innovation will occur and growth will occur. Um, you know, if you think of Silicon Valley as, as a classic example of this, uh, where an area of 45 kilometers squared hosts, you know, all of the biggest tech companies in the world, really. Um, and this is an idea that places have buzz for them. So you can go into a place that has buzz and learn from people, exchange knowledge, collaborate, create new innovations, share staff. Um, share overheads, reduce supply chains. So there's lots of advantages of being close together physically. Um, what we found in the study, all of the businesses found some sort of benefit from being there, uh, but the ones that found the most benefit from being there were the ones who were previously home-based, um, which is quite a common occurrence um, in rural areas, at least in, in the UK, um, where, you know, it, partly because of a lack of office space, but also partly because they're quite small um, and they have, you know, fine profit margins. Um, that working from home is seen to be um, kind of the first option almost. Um, so people moving out of the home environment found the biggest benefits. Um, and we'll discuss these now, there's four of them. Um, so the first one was improvement to business. I would say that, you know, 95 98% of the people that I interviewed um, said that somehow or other the hub had helped them to improve their business. Um, a very common one, and again, this relates to home-based businesses, was the ability to grow. Um, so if you're wanting to employ your first member of staff, let's say, um, a lot of people found that that was quite an awkward experience if they had to invite the new member of staff to their house to work. Um, they didn't really see that as an option. So being in the hub gave them that option of being able to employ their staff. Um, increased productivity um, also ties into the fourth point around in increased well-being. Um, lots of people found that they were able to focus more um, and avoid the distractions of working from home. They were able to separate their work-life balance um, and you know get to work work their shift and then go home and relax and not think about work anymore. Um, but it also helped them to increase in, in various ways um, their productivity. Um, and then we've also put new collaborations in, in this one as well. Um, so the, these weren't common. Um, they were more on the rare side, but when they did happen, both of the businesses found that they grew quite a lot from forming that collaboration. Um, we found that the honeypot hubs were particularly good at this uh, because they were they all had the same sectoral focus so one of the hubs in particular was all artists um, and they formed a lot of collaborations through working together um, other examples um, included um, well softer examples included companies hiring other companies in the hub um, to do jobs for them um, particularly accountants and, and websites designers they were the two most common where if you have a small accountant in the hub they can offer you know very tailored advice and, and accountancy advice to their fellow tenants um, and it's just really easy then for a business to get financial advice because they can just walk down the corridor knock on their accountant's door and, 
couldn't speak to them about any you know tax advice or anything that they needed about that. Um, access to networks we, we briefly discussed on on the last slide. Um, you know, for a, for a very long time, there's been a notion that rural businesses depend on on networks even more so than than urban businesses. Um, and the hub gave them access to both professional and social networks. Um, access to knowledge, both formal and informal. Formally, this was through business support agencies coming to visit or them going to training events. Um, or also we found a particular role that the hub managers would play in, in um, offering advice um, or going to find out where the business could go to get advice. Um, and then informally, you know, through the kitchen, sitting in the kitchen, talking to people about your business, uh, people getting to know each other's businesses. And, you know, we heard examples of people that knew that there was a certain type of business in the hub and they'd seen a grant being available that the other business hadn't seen themselves. So, you know, over a cup of coffee in the kitchen, they would say, oh, have you, have you thought about applying for this grant, things like this. Um, and then increased well-being as well, um, you know, and the, particularly the home-based businesses were very socially isolated um, where you know they would spend all day working in their house alone finish and be alone so being able to go and to be part of a community um, and increase um, that sense of worldliness is very important tenant um, this slide is for if anyone is potentially thinking about creating um, an enterprise hub, whether or not this is a public, private or third sector hub. Um, for this question, we spoke to the managers themselves and we also spoke to a range of policymakers um, in the region who were responsible for helping to fund some of these hubs um, to find out what the determinants of success were. So, we asked people what they thought made a successful hub and why. Um, occupancy level was the number one kind of um, indicator of whether or not the hub was performing successfully and whether or not the policy itself of helping fund these hubs was an efficient policy, effective policy, sorry. Um, so if you have a high occupancy level, you seem successful. If you've got a low occupancy level, you seen as less successful. Um, you know, this helps to know, to have an idea of this um, before you actually set up the hub. So doing market analysis, and things like this were, were very helpful. But one, one of the sort of spillover effects of having a high occupancy is that the services that you offer become better because of that as well. So. If you have a networking group, for example, uh, and you've only got two tenants, then it's not going to be a very dynamic networking event. Whereas if you have 30 or 40 tenants there, obviously it's going to be a lot more dynamic. And the same goes for business support, training events. You know, the, the fuller it is, um, the, more, the more dynamic it becomes. Um, the role of the hub manager was seen as, as crucial. Um, this was on a number of, of different factors, but people harked back to this time and time again. Um, and this could be something that in the future we look at more as far as a policy is concerned of actually providing some really good tailored training to be a hub manager. Because on the surface, it kind of looks like you establish the hub, you open it, and then the day to day running is, is the only task that you have left. Uh, but actually, um, we found a number of um, reasons why people thought that the management was was vital um, we found examples of managers who didn't necessarily have a core focus of operating the hub as their job and this was seen as almost an add-on activity to what they do and it was kind of this idea that they could just set it and, and leave it then get their tenants in and and forget about it um, and this wasn't seen as a good way of managing compared to someone who was there whose core focus it was to you know look after the tenant um, to have you know resolve any issues that the tenants had um, being flexible was also part of this to have a flexible management style um, to be able to accommodate for um, tenants who have 
particularly strange problems um, and to be able to deal with them on a on a one to one basis um, is seen as obviously a positive. Uh, being proactive in their management as well was seen as a as a determinant um, in the sense that some businesses, uh, so, sorry, some managers um, would would be very proactive in finding new opportunities for their tenants, um, finding out what business support was on offer in the region and inviting those business support agencies to come and deliver business support and put on training events. Um, whereas some of the other managers were a bit more um, stand back in that regard and um, wouldn't necessarily go out to find these opportunities. Um, you know the tenants themselves and the and the policy makers in the region that we interviewed all said that you know if they had someone proactively going out and finding these then it had the best knock-on effect for the tenants um oh, well this relates to the next point as well which is interacting in initiatives and and, and, and regional governance um and then finally they were considered to have quite a strong brokerage role um in helping to form networks in helping to put people together who they thought might be able to share knowledge with each other um, out and to collaborate as well. Um, so this idea that you really get to know your tenants and you get to know their needs um, and then you can spot opportunities that come along um, to, help them, to help them grow. So, you know, to have this proactive, flexible management style uh, was seen as a, a, a strong determinant of success. Um, the offer, I put this in inverted brackets um, because um, this was the, the terminology that they used themselves. Um, and the offer basically means what services and facilities you have on. So this would be a combination of all of this stuff. Um, you know, we found some hubs that um, offered facilities that weren't necessarily a right fit for their tenants. Um, and then we found, you know, obviously the opposite where there was very good fit and the hub manager had clearly done their market research before they'd started. They knew which groups of businesses they wanted to attract and to um, foster. Um, and then they would make sure that the services were correct for that group. Um, internet access, obviously, again, was, was a big determinant of success. If you don't have good internet, businesses don't want to, don't want to go, especially in rural areas where um, that is a big driver for them if their home broadband isn't very good. Um, being able to go to a place where there is good broadband is essential. Um, and forging a niche was also part of this where, you know, I gave the example of the hub that was all artists, for example. They had a very strong niche and, and because of that, they had a very long waiting queue of people that wanted to join the hub. Um, so that was seen as a determinant as well. Um, just a couple more. These are external to the hub rather than internal dynamics. These are external. Um, you know, I've been harking to this point a few times that market research, um, you know, prior to establishment is key. Uh, what competition do you have in the region? Uh, what is the health of the business stock in the region? What are the needs of the businesses? Um, and what, you know, particularly this last one is from a public sector perspective. Are there any current usable infrastructures that you can use? Um, found a few examples of uh, public sector organisations that either had to, due to cuts, had to lose some of their staff, so they had empty offices, uh, which they converted into a hub, or they had an empty building, uh, which they repurposed to become a hub. Um, you know, I think that there's also a role that we haven't really explored yet around destinations and around tourist destinations. Um, a tourist, a very popular tourist destination that has quite a high footfall would be ideal for a honey pot hub, for example, that requires um, members of the public to come to the site. Um, and then we also found that the policies which help support these hubs were also vital in their success um, in delivering business support. Um, there was also a, a, a policy initiative at the time um, which helped to fund the, the hubs as well. Um, so that gave a few people who were thinking about um, making hubs a bit of a kick to actually go and do it. Um, other hubs in the region applied for funding to make improvements. Um, 
you know, to make new communal spaces and things like that. Um, and then links to institutions, you know, I've put in brackets that urban because they all tend to be in urban areas, but, uh, you know, making links to uh, local enterprise partnerships or universities, research labs, things like this. Um, they were also seem to be a determinant of success. Um, yeah, I'm happy. Well, I'm sure Matt is as well to answer any questions. Uh, that was just a very, um, you know, wide overview of, of some of the research that I did. Um, I couldn't cover everything in this time, but happy to open this up into a conversation. Now. Thank you. Am I going to have a question? Okay, so. Hello everyone, I don't want to surprise you. Um, <laughs> hello you. Um, so we're going to go on a Q&A. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and just um, ask the question or if you can't for technical reason, you can post them in the chat as well and I will ask them. Um, so just feel free to unmute yourself and ask the first question if you like. Who's going to be the brave one? Good morning. Uh, and thanks very much. It's Simon McCarroll here, um, Simon. Colleague, colleague from Newcastle University. Um, I'm just wondering, and that was a really interesting presentation, I, I'm wondering though about the digital presence of these hubs and the hives, because one of the issues I'm looking at at the moment is the is 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 what does it look like online uh, in rural areas for uh, for musicians particularly, but also for traditional craft workers and things. And I'm wondering, can you say something about what did it look like? Is it replicated online or was it all in person? That kind of thing. Um, and, and, and how useful is it? Yeah, sure. Um, well, quite a lot of these hubs were just starting to be established um, around kind of 2016, 2015. Um, I would say on the whole, their web presence to begin with was, was pretty terrible. Um, you know, I, I could think of one, for example, that used to be a, a wedding venue and then they decided that they were basically, you know, sick of hosted weddings and that the, um, the competition in the area for, for that just, you know, blown up and there were wedding venues everywhere. Um, and their website for quite a while kind of looked like the hangover from a wedding business still. Um, and it's taken them quite a while to actually sort that out. Um, you know, I think it would be really interesting to go back to this and, and to have a look because of, you know, COVID obviously making everything go online. Um, there's a real drive there to, to make sure that they are looking professional online. Um, one of the things that did help um, was an initiative called Rural Connect, um, which was a network of Hub, well, part of it was a network of hub operators themselves. Um, so that was a, a knowledge exchange network, but it was also a forward facing website as well, uh, which had a map on it where it basically, you know, mapped the hubs in the area and then you could click on it and then there would be a little kind of sub domain on the Rural Connect page, but that was like a template. Um, so there wasn't much room um, for a lot of you know the personality to come across but i would say at the time room for improvement um to be honest it would be really good to go back and look at uh, and you know to, to look and see if their website presence has improved um has that helped answer the question yeah i mean it sounds like there's 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 questions to ask there you know um I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, from my own research at the moment, uh, you know, I've been doing lots of interviews with people in the Highlands and Islands on, um, on, on, on how they make a sustainable livelihood, you know, and um, I'm just amazed at how little they share, you know, so I, I don't want to bore everybody on this, uh, this webinar, but, you know, individual festivals are paying the same thousands of pounds each for fencing costs, you know, all to be transported to the same festival separately on the same year, you know, it's things like policing costs, fencing costs, public liability insurance, things like that. And um, so I'm really interested in how non-arts uh, businesses are managing to share these and, 
and how effective the shearing is. But thanks for a really interesting presentation. Yeah, no worries. Me and uh, colleague Fran Rowe at NICER are currently writing a paper about the honeypots, uh, which are the creative, you know, one the creative focused ones, um, and what their role is in helping to promote the arts in, in regional development as well. Um, so we'll sure to send you that when that's finished. Yeah. Can I just add a comment in there, please, Ian? Please. Um, just in answer to Simon's question there, I think part of the issue is always about working with businesses and, and getting them to a point that they understand that they're collaborating and they're not in competition. So one of the things I've done in the past is set up tourism networks with a view to promoting overseas. And it, it's a very difficult thing to get a group of businesses who under normal circumstances would be competing, for example, for a, for a group of, of um, visitors to an area, you know, bed and breakfast, hotels, would all be competing for the same business. And, and it was a, a quite a cultural shift to get them to work together, to pool their resources, and then to get to a point that, you know, we were looking at making the cake bigger. So instead of fighting over a tiny little cake this big, you were getting them to actually pool the resources and share with people and, and, and really think about what their businesses did and how they competed. And yes, fine, you know, they, they might be running accommodation and they were after the same bed nights. But if you bring more people in, there's more bed nights to go around and everyone can get. And I think that cultural shift is what we need to do exactly what you're saying. And I mean, surely the logistical thing about booking fences and booking toilets and having just recently been through trying to book some toilets for an event is it, it is about just almost having a platform where you can share that information and then liaise with Nixon's and say actually we need 15 we don't need 15 separate orders and and to be honest the way to a business is it through the bottom line so you know by economies of scale you're going to be getting cheaper fencing, Harris fencing, toilets, whatever it is you want to do. So I would approach it that way. Um, um, Melanie, while you've got your, um, while you're off mute, there's a question that's come in from Lucy um, asking yeah. about if there were particular training or educational events that made a difference to the su success of the respective businesses in the hubs. Um, I was only in the hubs for three or four months, whereas Melanie was actually involved in helping to put on some of these events. So would, would you like to answer that one as far as which which of the events do you think were the most effective? Just, sure. a bit of back, Melanie, sorry to interrupt. Um, just in, in terms of a bit of a context to that, I can really see how things like a manager, internet, a full buzzing hub would be the things that made the most significant difference. But um, but if there were any training events that you felt were really or acted as a catalyst, you know, and made a, you know, helped a, a hub change gear, it would be really interesting to hear about those. I think, I mean, obviously the, the presentation that Matt and Ian have given has been fabulous and it's really captured the fact that all of the hubs that I've worked in across the years have had very different um, personalities and you can pull some trends out of that, but actually they're all very different and they're all, and partly it comes down to the management of it, but equally partly it comes down to just the synergies of the businesses within it. And if you get a couple of really strong, innovative businesses within a hub, that's what makes the difference because they almost drive it from the grassroots up. But I think from a training point of view, so I should probably confess that I was one of the business advisors um, that worked within and across all of the hubs. So I set up one hub and I business gave business advice to an, a number of others across the Northeast region. And I think a lot of the things that really took them to the next level were having a, a portfolio of events and having a regular catch up. So whether it was a coffee morning, whether it was, it was actually creating that space for businesses to get together, which I think was more important than, or equally important to the, the kind of kettle conversations that happened because they just happened with two or three people. Whereas if you could get people to have a bit of a cake break and, and spare an hour once a month, 
everyone would come. And I think it was, as Ian said, it was bringing in, involving the LEP, involving strategic business support, bringing things in so you could actually get a bit of a momentum there and you weren't relying on word of mouth. But I think from a training point of view, we did some stuff on growth training. So really sort of business planning. You find a lot of businesses who accidentally started a business and then never took the time out to kind of look at what the next steps were. They were so busy running their business, they weren't working on their business. The other um, kind of, I think, strategic thing that happened was at that point in time was the growth in social media. So we put on a series of um, training and social media. So we looked at a general kind of online presence and then most people had a website, but you know, they might be using a, a social media platform, but none of them really were using it very well. Um, and equally people felt they had to use them. And it, there was something quite liberating about saying, do you know what, if you hate Twitter and you're really bad at it, just don't do it. And uh, you know, it's so, and we did a lot of best practice because I worked across hubs. We shared a lot of best practice between hubs. So it was about bringing people in and going, actually this business is doing fantastically. And this is where I think that whole cultural thing about, we had a really strong network across the region of businesses who were happy to share and share that expertise. And I think that's what made the difference because it sort of inspired people, you know, that they could take it on and do it in their own hub. Thank you. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute um, yourself, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Very interesting. Um, so I was just wondering because it's it's rural hubs, and I guess one of the biz, biggest businesses in rural areas is farming. And how many of the businesses were farming related? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I would from my own research, none. Uh, but there's a there was a very interesting dynamic there going though that. Um, a lot of the businesses were, well, not a lot, but there was definitely a, a, a percentage um, that were, you know, the partner of a farmer um, who, you know, obviously wasn't involved in the, you know, the primary running of the farm, but were left to, you know, diversify in a way. Um, you know, arts and crafts, uh, food related businesses um, who, you know, didn't want to sit on the farm all day and, and wanted to get get away from the farm and, and we'll go to these hubs. Um, the other one that I can think of actually um, is a, a food and drink hub, uh, which is set on an X farm um, where, you know, they, they provide space and support for the farming community as far as, you know, being able to sell food and meat and various things that the farms create. So I, I see it more as a, a supporting role and, you know, helping to support the the diversity of the rural economy outside of the farming sector. Right. Okay, thanks. I think if you look as well, a number of them were on estates. So they were a diversification from a farming estate um, who chose that was the diversification was to utilize their buildings and put in office space. And people really liked when we looked at, who, you know, why they chose to go there, it was about about the broadband and about the fact they had the space and there was move on space for them. But we also looked at a number of mixed hubs. So it was office space as well as um, more practical workshop space. And I think it was having, sometimes in rural area, it was having that mixed economy in there. So that really helped because you had people who were practically making things. You had blacksmiths, you had, you know, um, agricultural engineers, but equally in the same kind of group of buildings, they could have their accountant and they could have someone who was helping them doing their marketing. So it really it really brought those professional services closer to the practitioners in lots of right. ways. Mm, yeah, interesting. Thanks. There was, there, there was also one hub as well that I went to that had a theme um, because it was kind of associated to the national park. It had a theme around um, like planners and environmental um, sort of offices in a way I guess um, and then you know they, they had quite a lot of synergy going they had people you know working on neighborhood plans who you know the neighborhoods happened to be in the national park so they could then go 
and sort of knock on the door of the national park and say, would this kind of fit the planning regulations and whatnot? So, um, you know, there, there was some links to land-based um, businesses, but it was mainly, um, yeah, the sort of secondary link almost, yeah. Mm, right. Um, Katie, you had a question? And then Judith, okay. Uh, hi, um, Ian, that's really interesting. It's really good to hear um, some of the detail. Um, and one of the questions that popped into my head was around those businesses that um, need more space, who perhaps need storage space for big equipment. You know, they're not the accountant. They're not the small crafter. They're not, they're, they're the ones who are, who need to store all the all the portaloos um and the fencing and that sort of thing which i think is is an important part of of that sort of rural economy and i know in the past um some of my own research has shown that actually that having access to that, that space is really important for some businesses it, it um and it just widens your options in terms of your choice of what business you can start i wondered if the if there were any hubs that provided that that sort of storage, that sort of space, or whether you think that perhaps that limited who could actually make use of the facilities. I think that that's a really interesting point, yeah. Um, you know, we had that example, that it wasn't part of my research, um, but there was the small warehouses that Durham County Council made on the A1 and the idea of them was supposed to be it was supposed to be for seven small businesses wasn't it and then Amazon came and bought the whole thing but I think the warehousing space for small businesses is an interesting thing to look at obviously that then you know opens up avenues for export exporting you know potentially to a global audience um, and that would help kind of streamline some of the courier services as well wouldn't it um, and the supply chain as such. Um, yeah, I think that that would be an interesting concept, like an, a, a hub of warehousing facilities. You know, there were examples that I got kind of from the arts and crafts side of things a bit more where, you know, for example, there was one business that sort of specialized in knitting, knitted products and teaching um, knitting classes but then decided that because of the hub and because of having that space and that footfall they then opened up a wool sales business because they kind of had that shop window and they had that space yeah like you mentioned that you know they could suddenly stock you know hundreds of, of balls of wool where you know operate from home you wouldn't necessarily want to be doing that kind of activity of, you know, holding large amounts of stock waiting for, you know, a, a shop window kind of sale. Um, so, yeah, I think there is definitely a role for that. I'm, I don't think that we necessarily sort of help promote or discover those facilities to, to a big degree. Like I say, the, the one on FBA1 was supposed to be along those lines until they got hijacked but I think there are yeah. um, who beside Anik does that right. um, they have a number of um, workshop spaces so they're they're warehousing lots of things we've got a um, culture creative had all of their storage things in there so they do um, like Kew Gardens Christmas lights displays and things like that and and lit up um woodland walks and stuff across the, they do in in australia and um the us now so they were using that sort of storage it tended to be on a farm so you'd have some office space and some workshop space um one of the other hubs that i can think of i mean rothbury to a larger extent ian was downstairs was practical space wasn't it so you know there was a sign maker in there there was a um a chap who makes mohair socks so all of his stock is based there there's um a wood burning stove place so all of their stoves up so that's kind of there at hexham in hexham town the um food bank runs out of one of them so there's a nice mix of practical stuff 
Okay, so we have Judith for the last question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have this kind of interest on uh, building collaboration culture, what uh, Melanie already mentioned that uh, to make a culturalship and have the kind of idea that maybe these hubs uh, also can help uh, this change. So create more collaboration and uh, help to change the culture. So do you have this kind of experience? So do you have any measures that uh, the collab collaboration increase? And also I was thinking if there are um, incomers, so maybe citizens, so more diverse, making uh, the environment more diverse, so like freelancers from cities. So were there any incomers outside from rural areas? Yes. And the last question will be, is your PhD available? So is it, do you have a link for that? It's, it's good to read. Okay. Uh... So first question about collaboration, um, like I kind of mentioned in the presentation, I wouldn't say that this was commonplace. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, if you have two businesses that are in completely opposite sectors to each other, you know, what, what common ground is there for them? Um, I've been using this idea of related variety, um, which is a, a concept from economic geography again, which is basically implying that if you have businesses who are all in a very close sector, then there could be potential lock-in effects of that, that they, that they kind of know everything that there is to know in their sector. And, and then the collaboration sometimes becomes a bit closed because they don't necessarily want to share with each other. Um, and then if you get two sets of businesses that are completely unrelated whatsoever, um, then they find it very hard to talk the common language. But if you find businesses who are related still, um, that can share a common language, but might be in, in different sectors, um, that would be a good place to form a new collaboration. And, and the Enterprise Hub's been quite a good example of that, of bringing in, um, related but diverse businesses in the sense that you know they they have common issues that they face around scale um, and around geography um, but they're in different sectors so i think that that was one interesting collaborate well it, it, that was more informal collaborations where people were coming up with ways of overcoming issues together um, collaborations in a more formal sense of you know, making a new product or service together. Um, like I say, that the creative, the, the ones with the creative focus had a, had a, an easier job of that, let's say. Um, but there were still, um, there were still examples. There was, a, there was a couple of companies who were both sort of loosely in um, training consultancy um, businesses that by chance happened co-locate and they started putting on um, a joint package together um, to try and almost like Melanie was saying to actually get bigger contracts than they could have individually for example um, so realizing that both of them alone neither of them would have been able to apply for that contract but if they team together you know you, you then get half of a contract that you wouldn't have been able to get in the first place um, so I, I would say it was more like that than people kind of, you know, suddenly deciding to um, to kind of form their businesses into one. Um, uh, second question, well, third question about the PhD. I think that it's coming out soon. I think it's still currently locked up in the library. Um, but this year, as part of my fellowship, I'm writing them up in journal articles as well. Um, so hopefully by towards the end of this year, start of next year, they should be becoming published, um, of which I'm writing various papers. Um, I do wonder whether or not the it has we have been granted access to it by our library or not, but I think it's two years, isn't it? And I, I'm, I think it's almost two years to the month that I finished it. So it should be soon. Um, second question was, can you remind me what the second question was? Sorry. Income. All oh, right, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, that was 
that was an interesting dynamic. Um, I wouldn't say that there were too many people who decided to kind of commute from the city to the hub every day, uh, but there were certainly people who had my, sort of migrated from the city to the to the rural and had decided to set up a business. And I would say on the whole, they had um, quite a role to play in creating this um, networking and collaborative and open culture because, you know, they were so used to it operating as an entrepreneur in the city that, you know, uh, we had examples of people who, you know, had lived in rural areas but established urban businesses and commuted every single day um, to the city and then and then decided that they didn't want to do that anymore, so set up in, in rural areas but very much brought that attitude of we should be networking with everybody in this hub. We should know what everyone in this hub is selling. So, you know, if, if we come across someone who wants something, we can offer them a business in the hub rather than a business, you know, from the city or from down south or wherever. Um, and they were the ones who would be, you know, turning up to every training event, being there first at every networking meeting, making sure, you know, people who might have been a little bit more shy or a little bit less accustomed, let's say, to that kind of culture of networking um, felt at home. So I would say that those type of people were kind of conduits to help um, to help these events and, and collaborations, um, almost kind of like a facilitating role. Um, and yeah, I would say that there were, there were plenty of examples of people who had moved to a rural area. I wouldn't necessarily say that there were many examples, like I say, of people actively deciding to commute from a city out. Um, but, you know, post COVID-19, those patterns might have changed a little bit. Um, there were certainly examples of people who were willing to, instead of take the 10 miles or, well, let's count it in minutes, instead of taking the half hour commute to the city, they would take a half hour commute the opposite way and, and be a bit more rural and have those kind of tranquil surroundings to, you know, avoid the kind of mess of rush hour and sitting, you know, in a, in a queue for half an hour. Why not take a, you know, drive out to one of the more rem remote areas of the Northeast and uh, operate from there. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, if, if we look at some of Gary Bosworth's work and various others who sort of talk about this idea of, um, immigrant um entrepreneurship and, and that sort of spark that people moving from the city can bring to rural communities um is is certainly something that the hubs can tap into and i think then as well that helps them to embed more as well because you know we see lots of accounts of people um who you know are very entrepreneurial moving out into the countryside but then being met by quite a not hostile but and not you know a community that isn't necessarily um accustomed to that um so i think that the hubs helped embed the people who were moving out into the local community more as well yeah all right um so i'm aware of the time so i would love to thank you all very much especially ian and matt um for the presentation and I want to give a special thanks to Ian, because it's Ian's oh. birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Ian. Thanks for really, really a lot. Thanks for taking the time on your birthday to come and share with us. It's um, no problem. <laughs> don't say that. I will ask you again. Um, <laughs> um, so um, thanks to the both of you. Our next webinar will be next week, Thursday. And it will be from Dr. Jonathan Kemet and um, also one of our um, other colleagues, Abdullah al um, to share about how they bought their entrepreneurship module online and how they teach online. So it might be interesting, especially to those of you who do a bit more practical applied teaching, uh, try to bring some innovation in the classroom and they will share a little bit about their experience doing it. So next week, Thursday, same time, and I will send the log in later on if you're interested. So, Again, thank you very much. Please do fill out the survey, which I sent in a couple of minutes. Um, I would appreciate your feedback. And otherwise, I'll see you again in a week, hopefully. Have a good day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.